But tonight we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Continuing with the prologue, we, we kind of looked at that introduction last time, which will be two weeks ago. But tonight we're going to focus on verses 4 through 8. Four, verses 4 through 8. And uh, just to kind of give you the context of what's going on here, this continues with a greeting. And then John gives a doxology. By the way, what is a doxology? Praise. A praise. Very good. Doxology just simply means a praise. And so we see that in here. And then it's followed by a prophetic a confession. So sometimes we use the word confession to mean like, like we're going to confess our sins. We're admitting to something, right? But the other sense of making a confession is a belief. You're, you're stating your belief. Now, confess, I believe in Jesus Christ. So we have that kind of confession in here. Now, I'm just going to read verses 4 through 8 out loud. You can follow along in your Bibles. It says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So just in five verses, there's a lot that, that's just jammed. And that's the whole book of Revelation. There's a lot squeezed into a very short space. And uh, that is one of the reasons why it lends itself to so much confusion and misinterpretation because there's a lot going on in a little bitty space here uh, that the message is trying to convey to us. Now, the greeting. What is the greeting? Grace and peace. Okay, grace, that, that word is used a lot in the New Testament. We see this in, in Paul's letters especially. But it's the word charis. It's where we get our word charity from. And charis is grace. It means it's a free gift from God. And so in this instance, when people in the first century, just say people in general, would write a letter, they would always include a greeting and it was, a, it was a similar word. It had the same root, but it was karain, which simply meant greetings, like we would say greetings to somebody in a letter. Well, John and Paul and several of the New Testament writers kind of changes that to a theological emphasis, and they just say grace. Not just greetings, but grace. And they add the word peace. It's the same idea that the Hebrews would have of shalom. It's an idea of well-being being well grounded and having that peace with God not dependent on circumstances it could be the most term, turmoil of a life and yet you can have ultimate peace right in the middle of it because you're with God and and more importantly God is with you now John includes a fuller description of the source of this grace and peace than even Paul does uh, who's he say is the source of the grace and the peace? You can an answer out loud. God, God is. And not ju he didn't just say God. He gives us the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. The triune God here. Um, and we see the number three come up quite a bit throughout the book of Revelation, starting right here in chapter one. Uh, it's three descriptions uh, of, of who God is here. The Father and the Son are both described three different ways. The number three often represents sufficiency and completeness. So think about that. Think about the examples that you see, the, the word three, you know, things stated three times. Think about holy, holy, holy. Okay, what, what's the point of that? You could just say holy, right? But holy, holy, holy emphasizes it. You know how we, when we write and we take notes sometimes, We'll underline something because we want to we want to make that point, or we want to emphasize that for memory. 
Well, if you're speaking out loud, you can't underline your words, but you can emphasize it in different ways. This is one of those ways uh, you can emphasize something. So John highlights the return of Christ and the sovereignty of God. These are two realities that help us have hope for the future, and it helps us uh, be challenged even in the present, right? It challenges complacent Christians for sure, but it also comforts suffering Christians. All right, let's go back to verses four through six. This is, uh, this is really the greeting and the doxology here, the greeting and the praise. John says, and he's quoting, I mean, this vision comes from Jesus. He says, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Now, we understand that to be the province, the Roman province, Asia Minor. Okay, it would be modern-day Turkey. So the seven churches, why are these seven churches addressed? Why specifically seven, and why these seven churches? There were a lot more churches in Asia Minor. Um, notice here, another number comes up. The number seven. You'll see seven quite a bit. All the numbers in Revelation have symbolic meaning. So we're going to get to more and more of that as we go along. But why these seven? Numbers, uh, this, this seven here represents completeness. It, it represents fullness. Uh, sometimes it's, it's described as the perfect number, right? Or the, the, sometimes people have even extended to say it's a lucky number. Lucky number seven. But why is that? What is the historical roots of that kind of statement? Because they recognize seven to be completeness. And, and there's these churches are seven important and strategic historical churches in Asia Minor. And so they're representative of all the other churches, not just in Asia Minor, but all other churches everywhere. You can find you know, this church in one of those seven. You can find church down the road in one of these seven churches. So he says, Grace to you and peace. And these are fitting words for those who receive its message. I'm talking about the message of Revelation. If you believe what God is communicating here, you're going to receive grace and you're going to receive peace. And this unconditional favor, this well-being for followers, it belongs to those who follow the Lamb. You know, that's that's the, the greeting here, but it's also a blessing, right? And then he says, from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, who is that talking about? God. God, God the Father. Father. Mm -hmm. All right, that's talking about God the Father there. All right, so God the Father, if you want to get the idea of where this comes from, you have to go all the way back to Exodus 3, verse 14, where twice God's name is revealed as what? I am that I am. And what that means uh, grammatically is when you look at the, what God was saying to Moses there is that I will be what I have always been. That's the sense of it. past, present, future. He's always God. He never changes. He's always the same. And you can look at it and say he is eternally present. He's always there. And so there's a reference to God the Father. You know, I wanted to make this point too. You know, even when it doesn't seem like it, and it can happen in our lives too, when it doesn't seem like God is there, we need to understand that he really is mm -hmm. and that he's at work. He's in total control of the present we're in, and he's totally in control of the future that we're headed to. All of human history, he's in control of it. And then we have the statement that says, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, this is an odd statement to us, to our ears. But who is this a reference to? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So why does he say, here's that number again, seven. Why is this coming up? Um, yes, seven does represent, you know, perfection. Yes, God, uh, God the Holy Spirit is at work in these seven churches. And he's holding them together, right? But there's another reason why... John uses this statement. Why this statement is revealed to John. Yeah, but you have to know the Old Testament. Now, if you go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. I'll, I'll just quickly read that. 
Isaiah 11 is a prophecy about the Messiah, about the coming Christ. It says, uh, verse 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So obviously, the son of David, which is a title for the Messiah. So we know this is a prophecy about the Messiah. Now, the second verse says this, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Seven descriptions of this spirit is going to rest on the Messiah. So you have this sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit. So just another, John is pointing the finger back and says, this, the God that you've always worshipped is the same God that's in control of this that's going to happen. Okay. So if, just in case you're wondering, the seven, I'm just going to count them out. You have God, the Holy Spirit, described as the Spirit of the Lord. He is the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of fear of the Lord. Does that mean there's seven spirits? No. But it's describing him in seven different ways that creates a perfection, a, a unity, so to speak, here. All right? Uh, Ryan, was that verse 8? That was verse 2, Isaiah 11, 2. Uh, furthermore, you see very similar language in Zechariah chapter 4, talking about the Spirit, uh, where, where God is sending angels, but then, then the Holy Spirit is described as well. All right, so he's talking about the Holy Spirit there, and then he describes Jesus. How did he describe Jesus? A faithful witness. Firstborn from the dead. Yeah. So he's Jesus, what? Christ, mm -hmm. that's his title. He is the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth. So Christ here is identified as well, just like God the Father was, he's identified in three specific ways, three descriptions of who he is. He's a faithful witness. He's a faithful witness to God the Father and God the Father's plan here on earth and for all humanity. He's a uh, Attesting to what is true always. Even, even in the face, remember the Pharisees, he had the arguments with them. You know, they, they thought they were following God. They thought they knew the truth. But Jesus exposed them for what they really were. And he exposed the lies of Satan. So he's witnessing to the truth. But he's also a faithful witness to us. He is the ultimate example of what a Christian should be. And he is our example. There is no other. And uh, if you want uh, more scripture for that, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Well, Nir, what did you say when you, when you came in and sat down and I brought you a piece of paper? What, what was that scripture you quoted? Jesus said that we didn't, well, even he said about himself, he didn't come to be served, he came to serve. That's right. And that we're supposed to do the same thing. Ultimate example for us mm -hmm. in every area of our lives. And so... Uh, He's described as a faithful witness here, but he's also described as a firstborn from the dead. Now, that can be a little bit of a confusing description for us as well, so we need to unpack it a little bit. What is that talking, what is that reference to, first and foremost? The resurrection. The resurrection. resurrection. Yeah. The resurrection. Jesus died, very literally died, and came back to life as a resurrection. And so that resurrection, if you read the letters of Paul, that resurrection guarantees our future life, our future resurrection. And it also means that he's the sovereign Lord over all things, including death itself. Did you remember in your reading of Revelation, the final enemy, who is that? Death. Death. The thing that we have no control over whatsoever is going to be cast away into the lake of fire. So what an awesome, awesome book uh, to behold. 
and to drive us to worship our Lord and Savior Christ. Third description here is he is the exalted Lord over all earthly rulers. And there's lots of scriptures we can go to that talk about Jesus being the exalted and high ruler. So let's continue here. It says here, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. So this is what we call a doxology. This is a the part of the phrase here. And this celebration is about what Jesus has done. Okay, what did Jesus do? He tells us. Jesus first loves us. And how did he love us? He went to the cross. And he, yeah, he gave us life for us. He died for us on the cross for our sins. He paid for that by his blood. And that's what he did, that sacrificial work. But that's not where it stops, is it? He saves us from sin, but he also saves us to do something else or to be something else. And that is a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. So he, he makes us into a new people, a new community. You know, his, there, there's not even a hint of division between regular Christians and the priests of God. There's no division whatsoever, not in Revelation. So what does that mean for us? We're all preachers. All <laughs> We're all priests of God. Mm -hmm. And what does a priest do? A priest, a priest represents God to the people, and a priest also represents the people back to God. And how do we do that? We did it earlier. Through prayer. Through prayer. Exactly right. And so we are a kingdom of priests, and uh, it says uh, the rest of that doxology, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I love it when right in the middle of a statement, there's an amen in scripture. It's like, it's, yes. <laughs> so, the, the, so the appropriate response to what we've learned so far is what? Worship. Worship and praise. That, and you're going to see this all through the book of Revelation. All right, let's go on to verse 7. It says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Your translation might say mourn. That's a good translation of that. All the inhabitants of the earth will mourn. Now, obviously this is not talking about believers. It's talking about the unbelievers at large. When Christ comes back, he's bringing judgment. I mean, that makes it clear. And so even with that statement in there, and by the way, uh, where, where does this language come from? Somebody look up Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, and then someone else read Zechariah 12, 10 through 12. Who's got Daniel? Was it Daniel what? Daniel 7, 13. Okay. And who, who wants Zechariah? I'm fine with it. I'm fine. All right, Daniel 7, 13. In, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his, his presence. All right, so you have one title for Christ there. Did you pick it up? One like the Son of Man. Son right? of Man. That's the first one. Um, and how was he traveling? And what was his approach? Oh, coming with the clouds. Coming with the clouds. You know, didn't we just see that in Revelation? Okay, what's the description there? Behold, he is coming with the clouds. So Dan, this is a reference back to Daniel. Now, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Okay. So here's the second part of what John is saying. Now, he's not quoting them verbatim, is he? 
but he's, he's referencing back to Daniel. He's referencing back to Zechariah to point everybody to the fact that this, this Jesus is the Christ. This is the Son of Man that Daniel referenced. This is the one that when he comes back, and remember, it even referred to him as being the one who was pierced. Isaiah referenced that too, right? He was pierced for our sins and our transgressions. So it references Jesus and says, this Jesus, when he comes back, is going to be a cause for great mourning. You know, why will people mourn when Jesus comes back? Because they hadn't accepted him. They hadn't accepted him. Right. Um, they uh, realize at that point that Their judgment is coming. It's, it's here. And so God's justice, you'll see it, it stands at the very beginning of Revelation. You'll see it again at the end. And there's a river of justice that runs all the way through the book of Revelation. Why is that good news? Why is the idea of judgment good news? Because if we know him. If we know him, we've and been we judged already. Yeah. Him, yes. yeah. John makes that clear in his gospel. If you believe in Jesus, you've been judged already. And you don't have to fear him. Paul says in Romans 8, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to fear judgment. That, that's been taken care of. But for those who are outside of Christ, what did John say in his gospel? For those who don't believe, they're also, yeah, yeah, that does a judgment coming as well. Um, and there's a, it's a different outcome, isn't it? A vastly different outcome. That's why it matters what we believe. It matters that we sh share this gospel, this good news, with those we come into contact with, those we love. What about the idea of clouds? All through the Old Testament, even, you know, especially, it stands out in the Exodus of Bibles. Clouds represent God's presence. Okay, think about that. God was with the Israelites in a cloud of, well, a cloud by day and a cloud of fire, a pillar of fire by night, right? And you see this whole idea with God's glory um, all through the Old Testament. It symbolizes that. And here you see it again. Now, interesting enough, when you read that passage from Daniel, there's another title for God, the Ancient of Days. Ancient of days. And that's usually reserved for God. I mean, that's the title for God. So, who is Jesus? He's God. He's God. He's God. That point's made over and over and over and over again. All right, verse 8. Verse 8. Oh, by the way, before we get to verse 8, did you notice when... It said that everyone, all the tribes of the earth will wail or mourn on account of Christ. And then there's another statement, even so, amen. <clears throat> even so. That's my new statement right there. I have read Revelation countless times and passed right over that little statement. But now that's going to be my reaction to everything that happens in my life. <laughs> even so, amen. <laughs> So even with judgment talked about, even so, amen, even so. Hmm. All right, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, who is this a reference to? Who's, who's doing the speaking here? God the Father. This is God the Father. He is. This is one of... Uh, Real, really two times that he speaks directly in the book of Revelation. He's quoted directly here. Uh, the other one is Revelation 21, 5 through 6, when God the Father speaks up again. But if you take this statement along with verse 4, these statements assert God's sovereignty over all creation, over all time, over all history. And John uses the title for God here, the Almighty. Another reference to God the Father. And uh, you'll see that title for God. He's going to use it all the way through the book of Revelation. It's one of his favorite ways to describe God. Uh, the Almighty. There's a reason for this. And hopefully I can demonstrate it on this board here. Alright, who, who is the leader of the Roman Empire? Caesar. Caesar. Okay. All right. Caesar is a word that's been 
you know, translated down through the languages. That's how we pronounce it, right? But if you take it all the way back to its original Greek, here's, here's what it was. And I have to look at it so I can write it down correctly. All right. Alto curriculum. All right, this is, this is just a title. That means that he rules, he, he's a ruler, he's a Caesar, it means, literally means he's the emperor, what we would call the emperor. Now, when the Almighty is referenced here, that's a different word, very similar, but I want to write it down for you too. I want you to see the difference. All right. Look the same at the end, right? Caesar is a self-ruler. He's very limited. Mm -hmm. Even though Caesar is not mentioned at all here, this is what everybody in the first century would be familiar with. This would be the guy that everybody would call Lord. But when John introduces God here, he calls him Pantocrator, which means... He rules over all. He rules over everything. He is not limited. He is the Almighty. So uh, even, even in the language, you see an illustration that just paints it very clear what John is trying to do here for Christians to help us understand what's going on here. All right. Now, there's a little bit of, a, I just want to point out a little theological insight for you uh, of drawing some connections with the Old Testament. In the Exodus, okay, God delivered the Israelites from slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Slavery in Egypt led them to the promised land. And even before they got there, what did he tell them he was going to make them? He was going to make them a kingdom of what? Priests. Mm -hmm. What do we see here in <laughs> Revelation? Jesus Christ went to the cross and rose from the dead, which means that he redeemed us he delivered us he saved us from slavery to sin and it's not just that he saved us from sin he saved us to be something to be a people to be a kingdom of priests you see the same idea being communicated in exodus and you see it being communicated in revelation hmm. the details are different the idea is the same but god is is moving all through history to communicate this now, just a few more insights, a few more applications that we can draw from this short passage tonight. Um, but before we say that, Revelation, I want to remind us, is a prophetic letter. It's an apocalyptic letter. And so with that in mind, we have to make sure we understand that Revelation was written to, first and foremost, it was written to first century Christians first century churches in Asia Minor. So when we interpret Revelation, we need to understand if it made no sense to first Christian centuries, uh, first century Christians, it wouldn't make no sense to interpret it that way. So it wouldn't have, they wouldn't have understood that up one bit. It wouldn't have made a hill of beans a difference for them. So if we in 2022 are going to understand what the message of Revelation is, then we have to consider what did it mean to the first audience. Okay, I believe it, it extends down through the ages. It extends to us tonight. But we have to understand this was written in the first century. What did it mean then? All right. So, again, what about the seven churches? We take that as an example. We know that there are those who interpret the seven churches of Revelation as simply seven periods of church history. Now, what's the problem with that? Based on what I just told you. Yeah, it's an arbitrary division, right? It's an artificial division of history. But, but even beyond that, the first century church didn't have church history. That's true. It would have made no sense. That interpretation would have made no sense to them what's a bit. So... That we can we can pretty much toss that out. So, and we also need to realize when we read prophecy, especially a book like Revelation that contains prophecy, 
prophecy is more than just prediction of the future. You know, I think if we can get people to understand that, it would help solve a lot of issues. Prophecy goes so far beyond just predicting the future, just foretelling the future. Prophecy, to a great extent, is foretelling the God of Word, the Word of God. Mine's going backwards, huh? <laughs> the Word of God. And so we can't just arbitrarily take something that would make sense to us, but not to them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does everybody understand that? All right, so let's, let's make some applications. First, salvation is not just salvation from sin. It's salvation for us to, and it's been mentioned tonight, to serve God. He's allowed, he's, he's opened up the avenue for us to have a relationship with him, to be, to really have an identity. It, it almost sounds backwards when you say it, but until you give yourself up to Jesus, you don't really get a real identity of who you're meant to be in Christ. And so he, he doesn't just save us from sin, but he also saves us for so much more. And it's just, the, the cross is crucial to the gospel, right? Does everybody agree to that? Yes. But the cross is not the only piece of the gospel. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just want everybody to be on the same page there. So he saved us to become a community. Here, namely, he says a kingdom of priests which means a group of people called by God, right? We represent God. God is represented to us through, through one another. And it's something we, we have no idea the full extent of what that looks like coming up in the future. But it's going to be glorious. Now, any picture, I promise you, any picture you have in your mind of what heaven is, is going to, it's just going to be puny compared to the real thing. All right, second thing. The God who is the sovereign ruler of the universe is also personally present with his people now. So the God who created everything there is in the universe, the magnificent, powerful, almighty God, is the same God who's with us tonight and is with you wherever you go. And that's a very comforting thought to me. It's also a challenging thought. God is always present. He's always with us. Um, he is always in control, even when it seems like to our minds he's not. It probably just means that we're seeing the situation completely wrong. In our limited scope, our limited view, we only get one little tiny piece of the puzzle where God sees the complete picture all at once. So we need to remember that as well. And, and it also helps us to understand we can remain faithful. We can. We can be faithful to God as we join in doing what he wants us to do, knowing the fact that he's in control of everything. He's in control of all history. And we also know that his plans never fail. They will never fail. And third, Jesus Christ will come again. That point is made right here from the very start of Revelation. It's the main message. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back. And, and just the way God intervened in the first coming of Christ to offer salvation to humanity, he's also going to intervene in human history again with the second coming of Christ. This time, he's coming. He's coming in glory. He's coming as, as the righteous judge, and he's going to consummate salvation. And he will judge, and he will destroy all evil. Now, the older I get, the more I'm looking forward to that. And he's going to resurrect his people. He's going to transform creation itself. New heavens, new earth, the way the Bible describes it. We don't know what that looks like, but it's going to be much better than what we know. And he will live among his people forever and forever, forever. We can't even describe eternity, can we? Not in terms that we can really grasp what it is. The God who is in control is the God who's with us now. Think about Jesus he got in a boat with his disciples, and they started across the Sea of Galilee, and a storm came up. Remember the story? And the disciples are doing their very best to get to shore. They're rowing just as hard as they can. The waves are crashing over the boat. It's taking on water. Where is Jesus? Asleep. Asleep. 
He's asleep. We talked about peace earlier, right? Jesus was at perfect peace in the middle of a violent storm. They, now, remember, these are fishermen, veteran fishermen. They knew what storms were like, and they were scared to death. So it was a bad storm. Jesus was asleep. They go wake him up. Uh, they probably expect you know, him to get up and come help him, maybe bail water out or help row. What does he do? He speaks to the storm. Peace. Be still. And it stops. That Jesus is our Lord. That Jesus is the one who saved us. That Jesus is the one we worship now. And that's 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 awesome. He's gonna be with us in the middle of any circumstance we find ourselves in. And we will see him. And we will see him. As the song says, I can only imagine. And I want to close tonight with uh, just a quote from the Heidelberg Catechism. This is from the 1500s, 1563. But it puts in a little paragraph just a huge statement for us as believers. And so I'm just going to quote it for you. I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully paid for all my sins and redeemed me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head, yet that all things must work together for my salvation. By his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. It's encouraging words. Good reminder for us of who we are because of Jesus Christ.